as you all know, water is essential to life, but unfortunately we are frequently contaminating water. And um, so some of these contaminants are easy to remove biologically or with the current technologies, but others, especially the emerging ones, they are a little bit harder to remove and therefore it is important to find new alternative um, technologies. And this is mostly the case, especially with the emerging contaminants that uh, we are seeing uh, like uh, pharmaceutical compounds or even personal care products and new food, ad food additives and pesticides that are coming out in the, um, in the water. So, our approach uh, is really like to try to develop a novel uh, visible light photocatalyst. And the idea of that is actually by using semiconductors, typically metal oxides. And um, they are used as photocatalysts. And basically the way that they work is that um, you have the light that shines in, in the surface of the photocatalyst. And if the light is equivalent or greater than the band gap of the material, what happened is that the electrons, they will actually, um, the electrons, they are gonna go to the valence band of the material and they will be excited, which can promote uh, the induction band creating a electron hole pair here. And the electron is then responsible for the uh, reduction of dissolved oxygen to form superoxide. And the hole is responsible for producing actually um, hydro hydroxyl radicals. And uh, that can actually lead to degradation of molecules. So this is basically kind of uh, what happened when you have uh, photocatalysis happening. And uh, we can use the UV light, but you can use also visible light. In this case, I'm interested more in uh, visible light than UV light for, for clear reasons. It's much easier to have a system in water treatment that uses visible light than UV light. And you can even use a solar light, which would be very beneficial as well. So the material that uh, we selected for uh, this type of investigation is actually MO3. And the reason for that is this material, it's typically easy to fabricate and also have a large uh, wide band gap between 2.5 to 3 point electron volts. And this material can have different um, polymorphous uh, structures. They can be nanofibers, nanotubes, nanorods, depending on how you synthesize them. And this uh, material is actually a, a transition metal oxide. Right now, this type of material is using uh, in a lot of different applications like in batteries, gas sensors, solar cells, and more recently has been used for photocatalysis. And the problem with this material is actually the, pro uh, the dissolution that happens depending on the water chemistry. So in this talk, uh, what I'm going to be addressing is really uh, how we can synthesize different um, MO3 nanostructures and uh, try to understand how these nanostructures change in different water chemistry via aggregation or dissolution, which this would ultimately affect the photocatalysis. And uh, then we are going to discuss uh, the role of ROS species on this photocatalytic, photocatalytic process as well. We need to know how they are working, basically. So the synthesis, uh, we synthesize uh, different types of uh, MO3. One is actually a nanorod and, um, and then nanowires and nanoplates. Basically what we did is change the, the chemistry of the synthesis, but also the time and the temperature, how much time we expose uh, to the reactor. And then we ended up getting different structures. So we got a, a nano rods, we got nano wires and nano plates. And uh, clearly uh, this, just this change of uh, chemistry and uh, temperature led to these different structures. 
By characterizing them using SEM, XRD, and other techniques, uh, we identify in this case here that uh, the nano rods that we obtain, they have a diameter of 180 nanometers. And here is just uh, the measurements that we did over different um, areas in the microscopy. And while the nanowires, they had a diameter of 59 nanometers and the nanoplates 74 nanometers, they had a quite a different um, sizes and uh, morphologies as well. And in the XRD pattern, what we saw is that they actually, uh, they are very crystalline and um, and typically the nanoplates and the nanowires, uh, the peaks that we saw, they actually were characterized as orthorhombic uh, MO3, and while the nanorods presented a hexagonal structure. And uh, further characterization that we did, um, you can see through XP FTIR and um, XPS. So in the FTIR, uh, we look at um, the changes in the MO double bond O at around the nine, 950 centimeter. And uh, in the case of um, also at around 867, we saw the MOO MO, o band. And um, in the 595, we had the formation of the MO bond O as well. So all of them, they were actually MO3 formed. And then when we look at the XPS, we actually were more interested in looking at the oxidative uh, state. So we saw that the nano rods and the nano wires, they were uh, in the oxidation uh, six, while the nano plates were oxidation five. So when we actually look at um, the surface chemistry um, in more detail and do some comparison of that, what we saw is that uh, uh, basically they were they had very different uh, properties. So even the energy band gap, even though it was lower than three, they were quite different from 2.6 to 2.95, and the ratio of the bonds as well changed quite a bit between the nanoplates and uh, the nanowires and even the nanorods, as well as the ratio of uh, oxidation state. So pretty much the nanoplates, um, they were actually clearly uh, oxidation five while the nanorods were oxidation uh, six. So, and, and I'm highlighting these specifically because actually this oxidation state actually played a whole, uh, a role in the way that uh, these nanomaterials um, interacted with different water chemistries and even affected the aggregation and dissolution as well as the photocatalytic activity. So, and I'll be talking a little bit more further about that. When we look at uh, uh, the activity of MO3 in water, uh, we know that uh, most nanomaterials, they really depend on aggregation and dissolution to be active. And it's not different for MO3. So what we did, we actually used different salt concentration with ionic strength, as well as uh, organic matter. Uh, one organic matter, the extracellular polymeric substance, came actually from bacteria. It was extracted from bacteria, so it was really biological. While the humic acid came from Swinney River, so it's available in water, in, in environmental water. And uh, so we, we actually look at uh, how the effect of um, the salts, the concentration of the salts and organic matter could affect aggregation, dissolution, and ultimately the photocatalysis as well. And for that, we use methylene blue uh, to see the decoloration over time with those uh, different compounds. Of course, we have controls without any of them. And uh, to understand how the water would affect uh, the chemistry and the photocatalytic uh, activity of MO3. So when we look at the aggregation, initially. So it's a very busy graph. So bear with me. Here we are looking at uh, the ionic strength of the monovalent uh, uh, sodium chloride. And here this graph is the calcium chloride. Um, 
And we look at a different uh, ionic strength. So very low ionic strength and high ionic strength, same here. And we have here the nanorods, the nanowires, and the nanoplates. Similar here, the nanorods, nanowires, and nanoplates. And we look at the aggregation rate for all of them under different conditions. So basically, we have uh, different pHs. We have pH 5, which is the pH that when we finish the synthesis, that's the pH that you find the molyoxide a nanomaterial. And then seven, for obvious reasons, since we are planning to use for uh, water treatment, it's important to look at the pH 7. And then we look at different concentrations of organic matter, humic acid, and EPS. And mostly at pH 7, which is the important uh, pH for environmental applications. So what we saw is that uh, when you look at the pH uh, 5 and 7, Typically, what we see is that uh, the pH, when you look at them in any given condition, in general, we see that when pH increases, the aggregation rate are reduced for the nanomaterials, especially that's even more so uh, observed with higher ionic strength, as you can see here. Uh, and when we add um, the organic matter, either um, EPS or humic acid. Also, the aggregation is typically um, significantly reduced when you have salt and the ionic strains, especially for the nano rods and the nano wires. So you can see here. And uh, in summary, what we see the tendency is that uh, the aggregation uh, typically the nanoplates aggregate the least as opposed to the nanowires in both conditions. And then the nanorods is the one that aggregate the most. And of course, the highest, the ionic strength, they aggregate even more. So um, this is the effect of the water chemistry on the aggregation. And uh, when we look at the dissolution aspect, uh, using the nanorods and the nanowires and the nanoplate uh, under salt, uh, calcium chloride is the blue uh, and um, sodium chloride is the blue and calcium chloride is the red. You can see that they also play a role on the dissolution. And uh, the dis dissolution uh, here is just a nanoparticle by its own at pH 7. And what we see is that you have higher dissolution. Of course, you add more uh, salt or organic matter. You have, in some cases, a little less dissolution. But this effect is much, much more pronounced when you have salt in it. And uh, typically, what we observe, we observe is that the, the nanoplates are the ones that uh, has the least uh, the dissolution, followed by the nanowires and the nanorods. So when we look further on the effect of pH in the dissolution, which plays a very important role, we can see that uh, typically less dissolution is observed again on the nanoplates. And as you pro progress the nanowires, there's the second one and the nanorods are the third one with the most dissolution. And that you can see here that even the pH, the highest the pH, also the more dissolution you observe and the lowest the pH, the least. And uh, you, we could actually link this uh, dissolution based on the oxidation state. So as a, if you remember well, uh, nanoplates are, um, are five, oxidation state while the nanorods is six. So the, the, the oxidation five tends to be less, um, dissolve less than the oxidation six. And uh, one thing that we look at as well is actually on the removal of methylene blue, the photocatalysis. And we actually compare the dissolution at different pHs uh, with different, um, uh, dissolution over time. And uh, what we saw is that, uh, again, as the pH increases, you have more dissolution happening. And what you see is a trend of reduction on the methylene blue removal. 
And uh, so basically the dissolution plays an important role in the process um, of uh, degradation. So when you have dissolution, higher dissolution, you have a decrease in degradation happening. So when you look at the water chemistry um, on the photocatalysis, considering everything, the salts, the organic matter, and uh, the salt and the organic matter together, we also see different trends. Most importantly, what we see is that uh, when you look at, uh, for example, you have the methylene blue with uh, calcium chloride, with, which is a divalent um, salt. For most of them, actually for all of them, you have an increase in photocatalysis. So lower, um, this color, uh, color uh, this is the coloration. So the lowest the percentage is you have more discoloration. So you have more photocatalysis. So you can see here that the calcium chloride for all of them by itself play an important role. And what we, we saw as well is that the humic acid also, uh, and the, the, the salt, the humic acid, HA, and the calcium chloride, they also decrease the overall photocatalytic activity. So there is an important role of salts and even humic acid on the effect of the photocatalytic activity. Now, the main question is, okay, uh, we can get photocatalytic activity and sometimes even improved when we actually have um, salts and humic acids, but uh, what is actually the mechanism of this material in photocatalysis? Well, first thing that we looked is when we looked at uh, the product in the dark and the interaction of the methylene blue uh, in the dark with the nanoparticles, what we start to see is that um, here you have the different um, molybdenum in the dark, molybdenum in the, in the light uh, with methylene blue, the black and the red, and here is the same, the black and the red. And the blue is just the methylene blue here too. And then the green is actually just the nanomaterial by itself. So what we see is that uh, there are changes in the peak, meaning that uh, in the dark, we actually have some absorption. So the first step for uh, the removal of uh, methylene blue was caused by the removal by absorption. Now, is there actually a photocatalytic degradation? So to analyze that, we use HPLC for the degradation of the products. And here you have uh, the methylene blue uh, peak in the dark in the solution. And the, then when we look at the byproducts, uh, we actually see that uh, in the light, which is the red line superimposed over the, the black one, you start to see many other peaks. So there are byproducts being produced. And here are some of the byproducts that we observed, uh, thionine and azure. That, uh, so methylene blue is actually being broken photocatalytically as well. So the first step would be adsorption, and then when exposed to the light, we have the photocatalysis happening. And uh, how, how this photocatalysis happen, and what's the interaction that you see uh, of the methylene blue with the nanostructures? So to analyze that, we started first looking at uh, the XPS results. So we look at different um, uh, products and what are, are broken. So you have the methylene blue here originally, and whenever you have the methylene blue in the dark and in the light, we actually saw changes, especially in the quat any quaternary and the any periodinic and as well in the COOH bond. So that's, you can see a clear reduction of that and in some cases even disappearance as well. So it's, so the mechanism is actually uh, by breaking those types of uh, structures in, um, in the molecule of methylene blue. Now, we know that nanomaterials in general, uh, the way that they break um, chemicals is by reactive oxygen species production. So what we did is actually to try to elucidate which kind of reactive oxygen species are being produced so we can break down the chemical. 
And we use different techniques. One of them is uh, the Fourier alcohol detection, which detects the singlet oxygen production. And uh, we also use the glutathione degradation, which is a colimetric quantification and detects uh, production of hydrogen peroxide. And we use the fluorescence quantification from TA to HTA uh, uh, compound, which actually detect hydroxyl radical production as well. Um, so when we look at uh, the ROS degradation, what we saw is that the nanorods and the nanoplates produce more hydrogen peroxide in general, and that while the nanorods produces more singlet oxygen and hydroxyl radicals. But one thing that I want to point out is that the, the ROS production also depends on the pH. You can see that the production is changing with the different pHs for the glutathione, the singlet oxygen, and the hydroxyl radicals. So to confirm these results, we use different scavengers, the benzoquinone and the isopropyl alcohol and the TAOA that uh, recognize different uh, singlet uh, oxygen or block certain uh, reactions. And again, what we saw is that uh, the most important one that inhibit the completely removal was actually the TAOA, which is actually uh, responsible for the whole. So in this uh, investigation, we saw that for nanorods, nanowires, and nanoplates, the one that actually was a producing the, the most was actually the TAOA uh, scavenger, which is for the hole. So the holes in the MO3 are the ones playing the major role in the photocatalytic activity. Now, I want to finish up by concluding uh, that uh, this study. So we had three nanoparticles with different physical chemical properties that we synthesized and characterized. And we look at their water chemistry effects on the aggregation dissolution. And what we observed is that the reduced particle aggregation happened mostly at pH seven and lower ionic strength, or even in the presence of organic matter. However, the dissolution was reduced in the presence of salt and the higher the ionic strength was higher the effect as well. And the pH played the major role as well in the dissolution. Now, the structure of MO stability in different chemistry was mainly uh, related to the, the, I, the type of uh, oxidation state. So MO, MO5 plus oxidation five was the most um, stable form of MO3. And uh, of course, we also realized that the water chemistry also affect the photocatalytic activity. And overall, the divalent uh, calcium chloride salt was the one that increased the photocatalytic activity. While uh, humic acid and NaCl actually had an opposite effect on the photocatalytic activity. And we also observed that uh, ROS was involved in this process and uh, mostly the nanorods and the nanoplate, they produced uh, more hydrogen peroxide. And um, that's what I have. And I would like to acknowledge uh, my students that did this work, Janir and Sophia, as well as my collaborators, Stacy Louis and Dr. Jim Bao and his student, Jane Zung Hu, and my funding sources, the NSF BMI grant and the Welch, the Welch Foundation as well.